we come to greet you again in the name of our lovely Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and continue in our lesson and knew not out of Matthew chapter 24. We have asked the first two questions and answered them as best I can. What did they not know? They did not know that the end of their era was at hand. A brother has just informed me and reminded me of Hebrews chapter number 1, has spoken to us through his son in these last days. In times past, he spoke to us through the fathers, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, but has in these last days spoken to us through his son, Hebrews 1, 3. So when Jesus Christ came, it began the last days. They didn't know that. Second question was, why did they not know? And we read you verses 36 through 39 of Matthew 24. And we saw that it was because they were so given to one another that they completely omitted God. Our third question as we begin our second session today is, what did they come to know? It said, and they knew not until. Then they must have known after that. They didn't know until, and then I guess, until they began to know when the flood came and took them all away. You say, but they were all taken away. Yes, but they began to know something. That's our third question. What did they come to know? Dear so what we need to realize, especially in those first two questions, is that not only does it say the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, but it also says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, that God shall send strong delusion. You can't hold on to good old Santa Claus Jesus. We make him a sugar daddy. And say, oh, he's too good, he's too nice, that ain't my God, he wouldn't. If your God's not the God of this Bible, if he doesn't hate sin enough to bring wrath upon it, then he's not a God of love because you can't love righteousness without hating evil and iniquity. So we need to understand and see, yes, God may use the devil, the God of this world, to blind the minds of them that believe not, but it's he's God's servant. He can't do anything except God ordained it. And as I said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, it's God that sends the strong delusion, listen, that they might believe a lie and be damned. That's serious stuff. That's not the God that America worships, but it's the only true and living God. Let me read you Daniel 12 and verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So we see that they don't have understanding, and that's what Jesus meant when he would ask them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. If you don't understand what I'm saying, then you are of the wicked that do not understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, third question, what did they come to know? They knew not until. What did they come to know? I would like for you, if you will, to go back with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, verse 36 and 37. And this is Elijah's prayer. He is uh, on the mount, and all the prophets of Jezebel are there, and he alone is the prophet of God. He is going to, at this place, to let you know where we are, call fire down from heaven. And it's going to be a marvelous revelation of God. But he doesn't want them just to dwell upon the miracle, the physical thing, fire falling 
on a sacrifice that has just been soaked with water. He wants them to know something else. This is what they came to know too. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob. He's calling upon the known God. And then the first thing that he says after he identifies he to whom he's praying, let it be known this day. Number one, that thou art God in Israel. These people came to know who God was after the flood came. And number two, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again, which goes along with Malachi, the last few words, verses in the, New, in the Old Testament turning back again the heart of the fathers to the children. That's what this was going to do. But the point that I'm trying to make is when devastating things like this transpire, it is not all about the flood. It is not about the quail. It is not about uh, the fire falling from heaven and so forth. It is about knowing who God is. The prayer of this great prophet was that they may know that thou art the God in Israel, and number two, that I am thy servant. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ talked about in his high priestly prayer as recorded in John chapter number 17. He said, they have known that I have come out from thee. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So he says in verse 8 of John 17, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. That's the same thing Elijah was praying about. I want them to know you, Lord. But to know you, they're going to have to know that I'm your servant that brought these words at your bidding. Dear soul, you're going to have to come to understand that wasn't just a man up there practicing religion. That was a God-called man of God. And he was giving to you that which God had given to him for you. Not that you might know him, but that you might know the Lord. These people were as far from God as they could possibly be, but they were nationally chosen people. It was a chosen nation, but they had no awareness of God. Jesus said, these people draw nigh me unto me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. John said, you generation of vipers, offspring of snakes, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You don't hear God's word. You don't recognize God. You don't recognize me as who I am. Dear soul, there's a lot of unbelievable communication and different structures of communication in our world. You can see people everywhere working out with their thumbs on little bitty phones and tablets and so forth, or people at computers, and communication is unbelievable. But you need to understand and see that the way that God has presented himself to the entire world is as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. Now, I want to ask you something. And upon this answer, we'll 
hang all of your eternal well-being or lack thereof. Who is Jesus Christ? Now, I'm not saying who does Google say is Jesus Christ or who does a, you know, Bible commentary say. I'm asking you, who say ye that I am? The answer of that question in your heart of hearts will determine your eternal destiny. They came to know that God was God. They came to know too late that Jesus Christ was his servant, just like they came to know that Elijah had done these things at the hand of God. Philippians chapter 2. Here's what they came to know. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. I assume that means hell. Every angel in heaven, every human being on earth, and every soul in eternity knows that Jesus Christ is the Lord God Almighty, that he and his name is above every name, and that every tongue, everything that has a knee is going to bow, and everything that has a tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you think for one minute that these people are in eternal darkness right now, having a gay old time and continuing on with the party that they had before the flood came and took them all away, you're wrong. Because there is no pleasure, there is no joy. The talent of life and the gift of life is taken from them and they're cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, grinding of teeth. The pain is so great. And they're going to know that the place of their sin was the place of not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. John three sixteen, God so loved the world the world of humankind, that it was into that world that he sent his only begotten son, that out of all of those in that world that would believe on him, they should not perish but have everlasting life. But John three thirty six, but he that believeth not on the son, the wrath of God abideth on him. That's where the separation of all humankind comes is in the awareness that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God to take away your sin before you died physically. But if you didn't, and you did not believe on him, the wrath of God will abide on you because you believe not in his only begotten Son. Jesus Christ is the issue in hell. He's the issue in heaven. He's the issue on earth. That's what they came to know. They came to know who God was. And then in Luke 16, they came to know who they were. People are so fickle, they judge themselves by themselves. They will cut themselves a little slack that they would not give to anyone else. Oh, well, that's me. I'm, you know, I didn't really mean... They judge themselves by themselves, and the Apostle Paul said, Ye do err. Here was a man in Luke 16, beginning with verse 19. There was a certain rich man. He really existed, a certain rich man. He was clothed in purple. That's the kind of garment that kings wear. Jesus said, What went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? The man in soft raiment belongs in king's houses. So here was a man almost in a king's house in his, own, in, his, in his own abode. He was clothed in purple and fine linen 
And he fared sumptuously every day. What does that mean? He means he had anything he wanted to eat. Whatever he wanted, whatever, however he wanted to live, he, he, he could do it. He wanted something, he just got it. He fared sumptuously every day. But here's another certain fellow. In verse number 20, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Just as certainly as there was a rich man who had everything he wanted, there was a certain beggar who had nothing that he needed. One man had everything he wanted. The other man didn't have anything that he needed. He was laid. Evidently, he didn't have the health and strength to be able to go walk there and lay down himself. Somebody brought him there and laid him down, and he was full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. The only medication he had was the dog's tongue. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He said, the man has enough to fall on the floor that would suffice me in my life. Then it came to pass that the certain beggar died. He got free transportation. He was carried by the angels into the place of a paradise, into Abraham's bosom. The rich man, you got to remember this is under the law back during that day. The rich man also died, and it doesn't say was carried. He just kind of fell into hell and was buried. We go with his physical body. He was buried, put back in the dirt. But the thing that it says about Lazarus, was that he was carried into the presence of God. Now listen, here's what I want you to see. Verse 23 says he did something that he had never done in his entire life. He lift up his eyes. If you will look up that phrase, you will find that the exhaustive concordances say that it means literally to lift up your head and look up. But it also means figuratively. He considered and contemplated himself. It's kind of like the prodigal son who was, who fain would have eaten the husk that the hogs wouldn't eat. But it says, and when he came to himself, there was a revelation. God gave him an understanding of who he was, made him understand who he was, and it brought him back to his father's house. Dear soul, listen. All vanity in eternity will cease. There will not be any flattery from others to us or of ourselves regarding us. He came to lift up his eyes to think beyond himself and think with clarity and understand what he had done and why he was there. He looked around and Lazarus wasn't there with him. He could see Lazarus afar off and he then understood the difference between Lazarus and himself. And Abraham's going to preach him a sermon and make him understand exactly why the difference between him and Lazarus put him where he was. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments, never had had anybody to give him negative responses. Everybody flattered him. He was a rich man. He got what he wanted. You don't cross him, he'll cut you off. You won't benefit from his big fat purse anymore. So he was not so tolerated by God. God made him see who he was and it was those torments and knowing that he deserved it. Because you can read this thing forwards and backwards, crossways and sideways, every way you want to from here to next Thursday. And you will never find him saying, I didn't do it. I don't belong here. He never says, I have been falsely accused. He owned what he was. Because God made him see who he was and that the torments were just and that made him 
lift up his eyes and see who he was. What shall they know? What did they come to know? They knew not until the flood came. They knew who God was. They knew who Noah was. That was his servant warning us. And then they came to know who they were. He lift, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. Now here he goes, he's religious. He's going to revert back to his Judaism. He doesn't know God, but he knows religion. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Dear soul, for God to have mercy on us, he sent his son. This man was in the context of having somebody else wait on him and somebody else to serve him. And he saw Lazarus and he thought, well, that's the nearest thing I got to a servant. servant. Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. What was on fire? His tongue. James said you better be careful with your tongue because it can be set on fire of hell. And it is here. Where did he want the water? On his tongue. How could he have prevented that? Man believes on God in his heart and with his mouth confession is made unto salvation. He hadn't used his tongue for that which it only is designed to confess the Lord. We know he didn't believe in his heart because his tongue's on fire. Dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, talking to him as a Jew, believe, excuse me, remember that thou uh, in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. Remember. He's going to remember. He lift up his eyes. What did they come to know? They knew who God was. They knew who his servant was. And they came to know who they were. Remember. That worm is never going to die. The worm of memory. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. And you didn't care. But now, he is comforted, and thou art tormented. It's reversed itself. But I want you to know something. I can't do what you say because God has made effectually a great gulf. You can't build a bridge to cross it. There's no way to transverse it. And besides this, between us and you, ooh, between me and Lazarus and where you are, there is a great gulf, watch it, fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. We can't come to you, and you can't come to us. So we understand, dear soul, that he came to understand who he was himself. He had an awareness of himself. He had an awareness of Lazarus. He had an awareness of Abraham. But he had not been properly Related to Abraham, he was simply an Orthodox Jew practicing traditional religion. I wonder about us. They came to know something that they hadn't known because of the word until. And they knew not until. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 for now we see through a glass darkly, but then he's seeing Abraham and Lazarus, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then shall I know even as also I am known. We're going to know ourselves in eternity as God has known ourselves. You're not going to be able to escape by 
cutting yourself a little slack. Well, you know, I was just joking. People would cut you down with their tongue. And if you bring that to their attention, they'll say, well, I was just joking. No, you wouldn't. It wouldn't have come out of your mouth if it hadn't been in your head. It wouldn't have come out of your mouth if it hadn't been in your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's what was on fire. So he couldn't cut himself any slack anymore because he came to know himself as God knew him. And then it says, then shall we know, even as I am known. So they came to know who God was they came to know who his servant was. They came to know who they were. And then in Luke 12, he came to know what religion had done to him. Luke chapter 12. Verse 45. Satan as the head of the harlot church is going to be despised in eternity. He said, I'm going to cast him into a pit like a writhing serpent. And you're going to look into that and say, is this the man that caused the nations to tremble? That's all there was against me. Luke chapter 12 and verse 45. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, if this guy who's in charge of everything he says, well, my Lord's gone in a far country to receive a kingdom. I'm not going to worry about it. I do what I want. My Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. And it always follows. If you put God far off, you will give yourself to eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour, in an hour when you think not, the Lord comes. When he is not aware and will cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Excuse me. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, which he knew, shall be beaten with many stripes. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. It was because the rich man was tormented and his tongue was on fire that he realized that that being a just punishment meant, meant that there was a needful acceptation and awareness of his iniquity that caused that punishment to be just. He came to know who he was. He comes to know who God is. Dear soul, don't think just because people don't want to know the Lord in this day and age <coughs> that they're not finally going to come to know him in eternity. They will know him. Jesus Christ is Lord over heaven. He's Lord over hell. If you'll read the first two chapters of the book of Job, you'll find out the devil don't do anything to Job except he gets permission from God. The devil is God's servant. Nobody is on an equal with God. God is above all creatures. Everything that there is, is servant to Almighty God. So we come to see and understand that Satan himself is going to rise like a smitten snake, whack with a stick, throw it into a pit, and God's going to make sure that everybody knows that that's what happened to this world. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, and he's going to be hated and resented. They're going to be tormented by him. He's going to be resented and hated by them. If you want to see the perfect storm and you want to understand and know perfect hatred, I don't recommend this. Just go to hell. Just go to the pits of the damned, and you'll see it. 
perfect light and glory and perfect peace and tranquility in Jesus Christ and eternal glory in heaven, perfect hatred, darkness, resentment, but a perfect understanding that we are there because we deserve to be there. The rich man never, ever said, get me a lawyer and let's try this case again. The people of God are the only ones that have an advocate with the Father, and that's Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hebrews chapter 10, we read something out of that earlier. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 25, we read the, this verse this morning. I mean, during the other message. Hebrews 10, 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. Don't start forsaking, but start exhorting one another. Why? And start doing it more and more because you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, that is, failing to stay with those of the faith, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, you came to understand the truth in the church, but then you walked away from it. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Willful sin does not have a Lamb of God to take it away. What do they have but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries? And Peter is so bold to say it would be better for you never to have gone to Sunday school, never to have heard the preach word. Let me read it to you, than to know it and hear it and to walk away from it because that made you know God's will. Therefore, it gives you many stripes to be beaten with. Your judgment shall be worse than any of the others. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. For if after they have escaped, now listen, here's what church entity does to people. It renders them moral, but not righteous. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are then again entangled therein, and are overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Being a, just an honest lost man in his sin, not knowing the scriptures, not knowing the Lord, not having learned anything about God, he's better off. He'll be beaten with few stripes because he didn't know the Lord's will. But those who have come and have received the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the Lord and say, just a bare knowledge, just an uh-huh, yeah, that's right, amen. But it didn't get in their heart. And all that did was cause you to escape the pollutions of the world. But what happened to old John? Well, he ain't smoking no more. What happened to, what happened to, 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 to that old brother there? Well, he quit drinking. Well, why? Because he quit drinking because he... He started going to church. But come back six years later. He's drinking now more than he ever did. And I'm just not, I'm not using just smoking and drinking to say that those things are the sins. I'm, you can see the fruit that he bears and tell the truth, excuse me, tell the tree thereby. He will go back into, and we'll read it in just a moment a worse lifestyle than he had before he gave it all up because the scriptures and the gospel preaching and the, and the fellowship and friendship of the local church caused him to become moral. Now, friend, you can be moral and not be righteous. The scribes and Pharisees were. But if you're righteous, you will be moral. A righteous man wants to live clean before God and all men. Listen. It had been better, this is 2 Peter 2, 21. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment 
delivered unto them, but it is happened, listen, but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, you didn't change his nature. You just sent him to dog obedience school. But he's still a dog. The dog is returned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed has returned to her wallowing in the mire. The problem with this is that they didn't get a new nature. They didn't get the new birth. They didn't have it said of them, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. But they're still the same as they were. God's people are known as sheep. Sheep don't wallow in the mire. A sheep may fall into the mud hole, but he'll get out. He don't live there. You ready for the bumblebee and the buzzard? You turn a bumblebee and a buzzard a loose in a pasture, and I guarantee you the bumblebee will go to the flower and the buzzard will go to the dead carcass. Why? It's their nature. And so this man, although he went to Sunday school, he put money in the offering plate. He brought his kids to sit with him and made them be quiet and sit still and then listen to the message. Daddy was sitting there, and you get in trouble if you don't. And he began to act more properly in his relationship to his family and his wife, but his heart wasn't changed. And sooner or later, he'll get tired of it because his nature is calling him back to what he's always been, either a dog or a hog. He was not a sheep. And he will turn and go back to wallowing in the mire or those things he vomited up when he was baptized and got involved in the church. He'll go back and lick them all up again and get right back out there in it. That's what happens to them. They will come to realize religion put me in this terrible situation. I am now beaten with many stripes because I involve myself with the church and with the knowledge of the truth that just helped me escape the pollutions of the world. That preacher, all he did was he was a, he used to call them clothesline preachers. He just preached on what hangs on the clothesline. You better dress right. You better get your hair cut. You know, no drinking, no smoking. You got to sign a pledge. And if you do that, you're all right. We'll give you a free trip to heaven. They can't give you a free trip to anything except to a worse hell unless you come to know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they come to know who God is. They come to know who God's servant is. They come to know who they are. And they come to know how religion fixed them to come to this terrible condition. Our fourth question is this. What do they now continually know? What do they now continually know? He's in hell. He knows who God is. He knows who God's servant is. He knows who he is. He knows what religion has done to him. And now, what is it that he never, ever gets away from? What he continually knows? Revelation 22. The last chapter in the Bible, verse number 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He can't undo it. He can't change. He continues to know the ways of unjustness. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. There's not going to be any opportunity to recover themselves from the torments because the torments are just because of their hunger from their nature. They can't change their nature. Sows and dogs. So he's going to be unjust still. He's going to know that. 
there's going to be a hopelessness. Not going to be, well, sir, your lawyer's come to visit you and he thinks he's found a loophole to be able to get you. No, 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 no. As a tree falleth, so shall it lie. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, but he didn't get out. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He, that, he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. You can't undo a man's righteousness in eternal glory any more than you can undo a man's filthiness in eternal damnation. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man, watch it, according as his work shall be. You remember the fig tree when we started? How do you know it's a fig tree? Because it has figs. How do you know that this man is filthy and unjust? Because he is an evil tree and he can't bring forth anything but evil fruit. He will be that way throughout all eternity. It will never, ever be any different. Mark chapter 9. Very unusual verses. Mark chapter 9. Now, these verses that I'm going to read you are controversial. Not that they may contain error. They don't. But they are... Uh, th there's a controversy as to whether these verses should have been put into the scriptures this many times. Let me read it to you. Mark chapter 9, verse 44. <clears throat> well, let me read you 43 first. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, verse 44, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Same thing in verse 45. Foot offend thee, cut it off. Better uh, to leave have one foot in heaven than have two feet in hell. Into the fire that never shall be quenched. Verse 46, Exactly the same as verse 44. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Verse 48. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now I submit to you that whether we get into it, and I'm not going to get into it, whether those verses should have been put into the scriptures or not. I don't mess with things like that. It doesn't matter whether in there one time or three times, it's still the truth. What do you take the worm to be? Well, when the flesh dies, the worms begin to eat the flesh, gnawing on it. And long as the flesh is there, the worm is gnawing. I take it to mean the memory. They're never, ever, 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 ever going to have a moment's peace. They're going to have themselves as their own uh, executioner, a condemner. They're going to have to abide with guilt and condemnation. Christian, you ought to be thanking God every day that God has delivered you from guilt because he's delivered you from sin. And this man is in hell and he's never going to be delivered because the worm is never going to die. Isaiah 66 Verse 23 and 24. This is where the idea of that comes from. Isaiah 66. The last chapter in the book of Isaiah. And the last two verses in the book of the last chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 66, 23. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another... Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. 
For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. The concept of hell comes from the term Sheol or Gehenna. Hebrews talks about the carcasses of the beast that they brought into the temple for sacrifices uh, were brought out and burned in fire in the valley of Gehenna. That's where they looked and said, that's like hell. And that's where this comes from. And God said, those that worship me and those that stand before me, I'm going to let them go forth and look at the carcasses of men and see that those worms are going to continue eating that flesh. And that fire, the smell of burning flesh, is never going to stop because of the condition that they are in. And so we understand and see that the thing that they're going to continue to know is how wretched they are, tormented by demons in hell, eternally separated from all hope, never, ever the shred of hope. Nobody's coming. You're there by yourself in eternal darkness. So why don't you learn to be by yourself in eternal light and not be socializing with Adam and his race? For Jesus said, your foes shall be they of your own household. And Why don't you come to be alone with God and say in him is my hope, my salvation. He is my family. In him I trust. He's my Lord. I'm going to seek the Lord while he may be found. I'm going to call upon him while he's near. And I'm going to understand and, and see that in all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge him. And Jesus made the statement, if there's five in one family, there's going to be two separated from three and three separated from two. If there's two women in the field working, God take one in redeeming grace and leave the other one. You can't be sure that because of natural birth that you have anybody there that can take care of you and look after you and is worthy of you turning your back on God for. But God said, if you fall after me, I'll give you houses and land, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers with persecution and in the world to come, eternal life. Folks, listen. Social distancing? What about on a spiritual basis? Some of my kin folks back when I was young some of my cousins got me in a lot of trouble because I was stupid enough to do that which they suggested. They knew they'd get in trouble if they did it, so they got me to do it. And I learned, don't do what they say. You get in trouble. Little bitty lesson. Lesson in the flesh, yep. But it turned into a great big lesson when I realized that I must Turn my eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world, including eating and drinking and married and giving in marriage and having great fellowship one with another. And basically that's all church entity is today. Everybody enjoying everybody else. Where's God? Where's the Christianity in that? But I learned. The things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let me lead you, leave you with the answer to a question in Matthew 24. Just a couple of verses. What can we do? That's, that's what you need today is to find out what am I supposed to do now? Okay, here it is. Matthew 24, verse 42. Verse 42. Watch therefore, 
For ye, that is you personally, know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have permitted or suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who, what is going to encourage you to escape the damnation of being caught off guard? It's not going to be the world. It's not going to be your cousin. It's not going to, it, it, nobody can do it except you with Jesus, you and the Lord. If in an hour that ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, is the Son of Man your Lord? Then you'll be ready for him. Be ye also ready. The Lord is coming back. And I don't want it said about you, and I sure don't want it said about myself, that they knew not. May God bless you.